Good evening and thank you for joining us. A violent assault from last week is now being considered a homicide. Thunder Bay police have confirmed that the 63-year-old male victim has died in hospital of his injuries. The attack happened last Wednesday on Robertson Street. 24-year-old Randy Andrews was initially charged with aggravated assault, but that charge has now been upgraded to second-degree murder. The name of the victim hasn't yet been released. Police note the two were known to each other. Inspector Jeremy Pearson, Detective Inspector Jeremy Pearson, calls it an extremely violent attack, but is offering few other details at this time and isn't ready to reveal if a weapon was used. At this point, with regard to specifics, uh, all I'm at liberty to say is that we acknowledge that this was an extremely violent incident and that the injuries were the result of a very serious assault. Of course, uh, we are always interested to know anything that the public is aware of, anything they may have heard, or any uh, potential evidence they may be in possession of, as you say, dash cam footage, uh, home surveillance that may have captured this incident. We are, of course, always seeking new information should it be uh, available. Pearson did confirm today that police don't believe the attack was drug-related. This is the city's fourth murder of the year. OPP are investigating a suspicious death in Pekanjikum First Nation. One person was pronounced dead at the local nursing station on Monday after police and Pekanjikum peacekeepers responded to a residence that evening. Police say an autopsy will take place in Toronto to confirm the cause of death and the identity of the deceased. They don't believe there's an ongoing threat to public safety in that community. Saturday is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which is meant to pay tribute to survivors of Canada's residential school system and the children who never returned home. Today at Queen's Park, members were given an opportunity to speak about what that day means to them. Kawetanung MPP Saul Mamakwa is a residential school survivor. He delivered a powerful speech about some of the abuse suffered at the Sterling Lake Indian Residential School and why the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is so important. And while we recognize that this can be a difficult subject matter for many people, we've chosen to give you an extended look at some of what he had to say in the legislature. Take a listen. I have no memory of grade 10. I see my photo in the grade 10 yearbook. I can't hardly believe it. It's as if uh, the entire year has disappeared from my life. The picture in the, the pictures uh, in the yearbook says I was there, but I remember nothing. There's also a photograph of a convicted uh, pedophile, Ralph Rowe, who used to fly to the school on his float plane to administer to the Anglican boys. He was a notorious sexual offender with upwards of 500 victims. When I flip through the yearbook, many of my friends, the faces I see staring up at me, have died. They have left too young for the spirit world. Violent deaths, suicides, addiction. Why have so many left us? Their spirits were broken. They could not carry on. Why? Because of in Indian residential schools. Because of their abuse, violence, and their demons imposed on them. They did not ask to be born into this history, one of oppression, one of subjugation, but they were. All over Canada, we see the horrors of this history that this country has largely, largely chosen to ignore. We are searching for our children, for our families, our family members. All over Turtle Island, they are in the shallow graves outside old churches residential schools on what is now private property, and they are buried in the lands surrounding old Indian hospitals, TB sanatoriums, and asylums. 
over 10,000 suspected remains of children have been discovered all over the place in Turtle Island. Yet still, people deny it is true. They deny that Indian residential schools were horrible places. These deniers have websites and posts on social media what has become an acceptable form of hate, denying the truth of Indian residential schools. This must end. Mamakwa's powerful statement continued. He called on the Ontario government to do its part to combat residential school denialism and misinformation. He received an extended standing ovation from all MPPs in the legislature. Well, in honor of Truth and Reconciliation Day, a new mural was unveiled at LU's Boralaskan Faculty of Law in the faculty's Indigenous Student Center. It was designed by two local Indigenous artists to honor residential school survivors. Joe Sadowski has the story. This mural, which pays tribute to residential school survivors, which was designed by Indigenous artists Jada Ferris and Karina McKay of Nietzsche Studio, it's titled Where the Heart Gathers and took them about two months to finish. When we came here, we, it kind of took a, a life on its own and it's been really exciting to like build off our, our ideas with each other. The mural is beautifully displayed on the front wall of the school's Indigenous Centre and Dean Eula Hughes calls it a perfect addition. The students have been very much looking forward to um, having this piece of art here and um, as uh, Director Sutherland I think had a chance to explain earlier, um, the mural has been a hope uh, for the space for a very long time and so the ability to realize it this year has been the source of a great deal of excitement and anticipation. Second-year law student Francine McKenzie believes it makes the school feel more inclusive and gives her and the other law students a stronger sense of belonging. You grow up with the system and justice against you. It feels like so it's very um, amazing to um, have a space here and to feel welcomed and to have the support of the school as you're um, on your educational journey in law. After the mural was unveiled, more than 25 people, including students and staff, participated in a silent march around Waverly Park to mark the upcoming Truth and Reconciliation Day. Joe Sadowski, TBT News. Public secondary school teachers here in Ontario have voted in favour of a deal that guarantees there will be no strikes or lockouts while the parties are at the bargaining table. Siobhan Morris has the details. The morning school routine has been locked in for students in Ontario's public high schools until at least 2026. OSSTF members have approved a setup that would see them go to binding arbitration if they can't negotiate a new contract in 30 days. This is a huge achievement for 400,000 students and their families, and I'm grateful to all the parties for coming together to put kids first. Seventy-eight percent of union members signed off on arbitration. We don't trust the Ford government to, to fund education to make sure that the money is there, so it will be in the hands of an arbitrator if it can't be settled at the table. And our members have said, yes, that's probably the best pathway with the government that we have. Still, Littlewood says she's felt a positive shift at the bargaining table the last few weeks. Because of the Greenbelt scandal, the Ford government's looking for some good news. I'm looking for good news in education, and it hasn't been there. The education minister brushes off the idea that the Greenbelt has anything to do with it. It's been very clear from the beginning. We want to demonstrate a commitment to keeping kids in school. While the government waits for an answer on its appeal of a court decision striking down its wage capping legislation. The agreement includes um, a commitment to Remedy 124 for um, recognition that we want to make sure that we take this issue off the table. With this OSSTF framework now established. We would reasonably expect the other unions to work with us quickly and the delay but signed a deal that keeps these kids in school. The education minister points to new EQAO results as evidence of the importance of that classroom experience. He sees moderate improvement, but with only half of kids in grade six meeting math standards, he says it's clear there's more to do. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. Dinah Nielsen is the district OSSTF president for this area and part of the bargaining unit for teachers and occasional teachers. 
Local bargaining continues past that provincial deadline until next spring. Nielsen says the, these are some of the outstanding issues that still need to be resolved on that level. Well, there's a number of issues. Um, you know, uh, classroom conditions are, are, are huge. Uh, certainly the uh, uh, deteriorating uh, working conditions have been very challenging in terms of staffing and retention. Um, as well, um, things like um, the grants for students' needs, which have, which have dropped in the past five years by approximately $1,200 by students. So, you know, we're hoping that this proposal um, creates a pathway to securing uh, real investments in public education. Local bargaining can continue until March 28th before heading to binding arbitration. Canada's National Food Bank Network has published a poverty report card. The situation across the country isn't looking good as a whole, and particularly here in Ontario, which was given one of the lowest scores across the country. But local anti-poverty advocates say things are especially dire here in Thunder Bay. Lee Noonan has the details. Food Banks Canada has published a national poverty report card, and Ontario is getting poor marks, with a grade of D-. The province is failing when it comes to housing expenses, access to health care, the general standard of living and legislative processes. Local advocates say it's being felt acutely here in our city. We really haven't seen a lot of movement in, in that area to support uh, the food insecure individuals or housing or the, any ODSB reforms. It just hasn't been happening. So when I see a D minus, I go, yeah, that's about right. When we look at the statistics, you know, um, of Ontario compared to Thunder Bay, of course, I, I think the statistics in Thunder Bay are showing that um, it's much more grave. The report highlights the large population of working class people struggling with poverty, something both Crom and Krizawadi agree is a real issue here. It's not just the, the unemployed or the homeless, it's also the people who are trying to carry, hold down one or two jobs just to make ends meet. It's really getting difficult because they all say the same thing. Their food budgets have doubled, so they be able to pay their rent and their mortgages, they are struggling. Right now, the living wage is $19.70 an hour. Uh, in the northern uh, part of Ontario, including Thunder Bay. And we know that if people make at least that much money, they are able to meet most of the social determinants of health. They believe the government needs to support a living wage and offer more social assistance. Those incomes are so low. You know, some people um, earning less than $1,000 per month. And if we can just imagine that, it, it really is uh, creating poverty. Crom says that as the needs are increasing, the supply of food is plummeting drastically with the end of pandemic-related government food programs. The money dried up and the food dried up. There was such a change and it was almost frustration and hopelessness that people felt, well, where's the food? And I said, it's not there anymore. And the RFDA isn't immune to rising costs. Crom estimates that just his operational budget has increased by about 85% since last year. He acknowledges he's going to have to sharpen his pencil to keep the doors open. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Norwest Community Health Center provided the chance to safely dispose of unused or expired medication or even street drugs today. The annual drug amnesty event was held in collaboration with the Thunder Bay Police Service. The community was able to bring prescription meds, over-the-counter drugs and illicit drugs and paraphernalia to the facility for disposal. It's all confidential and those who dropped off the drugs were able to do so without the risk of prosecution. About 20 gallons of drugs were brought in over the course of about three hours. Director Jennifer Anderson says it's all about creating a safer community. Getting prescription medications that are expired and in closets, in um, medicine chests off the streets and into a safe place so they could be discarded and not returned to the streets. Safer way to look after the community and the surrounding areas. This wasn't the only chance to get rid of unused or expired prescription drugs. Pharmacies also offered that service year-round. Last year in Ontario, 133 people were killed in deadly fires. That's the highest number in more than 20 years. In many of those cases, there were found to be no working smoke alarms. That's why Thunder Bay Fire Rescue is urging everyone to test their alarms. 
Today is the very first Test Your Smoke Alarm Day in Ontario. It's titled Save by the Beep, a play off the 90s show Save by the Bell. Thunder Bay Fire Chief Greg Hankio says residents should test their alarms regularly and also plan out an escape route in the event of a fire. I think we need to plan collectively for home fire safety and working smoke alarms is really a big key to that and home fire escape plans. So for the matter of a few minutes out of your day, um, you know, where you, you could be saving your life or your loved one's lives, just take the time to check your smoke alarm. Residents whose smoke alarms aren't in proper working order can also face hefty fines. Smoke alarms have been legally required on every story of a home since 2006. Well, turning to weather now, Mitch, it's like Groundhog Day. All yes. this week we're talking about these glorious temperatures and that continued today yeah. and there was even more sunshine than we've seen over the last few. And that trend is hoping to continue heading into the week, but there is some rain and thunderstorms on the way, even though the temperature seems to stay very warm, even though we see some rain in the region today. A little bit cooler, low of 7, still making its way up to 18, about 3 degrees above seasonal temperatures. The wind was making its way from the southeast 4 to 19 kilometers. And we saw a lot of clouds today with some sun making its way through. Now, as we head to the region, there is a bigger system making its way in heading into tonight, especially in the Fort Francis, Kenora and Dryden area. The storm is starting farther southwest and it's going to make its way really up the west side of the region, bringing some rain and thunderstorms over the next couple hours heading into the morning. So rain and thunderstorms making its way, especially in the Fort Francis area. It is going to push farther north into Red Lake, Sioux Look and Pickle Lake, all sitting at 17 clouds at the moment. Now they could see a little bit less rain as the farther north the system makes its way up. It starts to disperse and really not be as potent of a storm, but still chances of thunderstorms making its way all the way up there while farther northeast could see a little bit of showers, especially with the storm breaking up later in the night. But other than that, just going to see some clouds in Armstrong and Greenstone sitting at 17, while also 17 in Marathon with a little bit of warmer temperatures currently in Sault Ste. Marie at 19. They saw plenty of sunshine throughout the day, and it is going to be fairly clear heading into the night. Now, speaking of tonight in Thunder Bay, temperatures, they're going to drop down to around 12. So still sitting fairly warm here in the region. Patchy clouds as well, and the wind's going to pick up from the east-southeast from 6 to 19 kilometers an hour. And as we look ahead for the week, there's more warm temperatures on the way, but also some thunderstorms that could stick around for just a little bit. Okay, thanks a lot, Mitch. Well, a boon for Canada's economy today, and specifically the economy of Quebec. A $7 billion electric vehicle battery manufacturing plant is coming to that province. We'll have the details when your Thursday news hour continues right after the break. It was like you found the grid, uh, yeah, we found the raw material supply.